Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with Osman Noor, who is co-director of The Civilian Agenda. The website is thecivilianagenda.org. He's speaking with us from Jordan. Osman Noor, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Lots of things to talk about. You've worked on disarmament. You've worked as a, a refugee lawyer. You've recently been working on an energy embargo. Maybe we should start with that. It seems very uh, relevant and timely. Yes, sure. Um, I was coordinating uh, the global energy embargo for Palestine. Uh, The goal of that coalition is to achieve a two-way energy embargo against Israel um, to stop the genocide. And so that includes uh, oil, gas, Um, coal and military fuel. Um, So this is in light of the genocide that's going on, but also um, cases in the International Court of Justice that have ruled that the occupation of the West Bank is unlawful, that apartheid is being practiced, um, and therefore a a need to prevent uh, the, uh, uh, the, the genocide that is going on there as well now. Um, And we thought that the best way to achieve that in a nonviolent way would be to achieve an energy embargo so that the genocide couldn't continue. Um, I'd love to see a weapons embargo as well. But uh, what what specifically I I know there was some effort to try to stop ships from leaving Greece. Um, What uh, what specifically were you trying to block? Um, So so there are various elements of that work. Um, So the arms embargo absolutely um one of the hardships with the arms embargo is the ability of israel to sustain itself by uh, arms provided by the united states and the united states seems to be willing to be an active partner in this genocide regardless of uh, rulings made by the international court of justice or worldwide public opinion um and so the alternative Uh, to essentially prevent the machinery of the uh, war, uh, the genocide to continue, would be to prevent energy from getting there. Um, So the US also, apart from providing weapons, provides the fuel uh, for the military jets um, on uh, the same two ships that come to Israel every two months. Um, It's the overseas Santorini and the overseas Suncoast. So we found out that the overseas sun coast was making its way across the Atlantic through the Mediterranean to get to Israel. And it typically was docking in Spain on the way there, both to offload and uh, reload uh, cargo and to refuel the ship itself. So we started a campaign across the Mediterranean called No Harbor for Genocide to uh, call upon trade unions, parliamentarians, port authorities, governments, Uh, and members of the public to help prevent this ship from docking. Quite successful in that um, the Spain rejected the ship, Gibraltar rejected the ship, um, and it usually would have gone to Malta as an alternative and it didn't go to Malta. So um, quite good in getting the public aware of these ships, but unfortunately the ship basically just turned off its tracking system, uh, went into incognito mode, (laughs) if you will, and um, made it to Israel to to deliver the fuel. But we've also been successful in in getting uh, an executive, firstly, an executive decision from the president of Colombia, which provides 60% of Israel's coal uh, to now stop selling coal to Israel. It then went it then went through the uh, machinery in Colombia to get confirmed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Mining. All, all of them have now signed off on that and uh, no more coal from Colombia to Israel. So um, that's that's one way of effectively isolating Israel and letting it know that the world won't tolerate what we're seeing. Absolutely. I, I know here in the United States, some people are protesting and holding posters and handing out flyers at gas stations, protesting particular oil companies, gas companies that provide fuel to Israel. Um, I think it's a good educational technique. I don't know how effective it is. What do you think? 
Well, I think the reality we have now is a a force that seems to be unwilling to heed the call of international law, of global public opinion, um, of global conscience on this issue. And it seems it, one of the hardships of the last 10 months is screaming our lungs out, calling for a ceasefire and seemingly falling on deaf ears. So, yes, I can understand why there's a sense that uh, holding up banners at stations, calling companies out may feel um, like it's not effective. But unless we carry on doing that, um, we would be giving the impression that we're OK with this. Uh, and I think the work that is being done does have an impact. Every little does matter um, because actually it, it's it's a giant wall that we're trying to bring down. And if each of us can, you know, do do some work on each on, on the brick that's in front of us, then, you know, the wall will collapse. But it is not just Israel. It's this entire military industrial complex that feeds off war um, that needs to be confronted here. And yes, the energy sector is complicit. Um, other industries are complicit. And I think we, we can all tackle it in our own ways. Um, and the, the peak of that uh, mountain, if you will, is, is the genocide in Gaza. But I think it's um, a whole war mindset that I hope can, can ultimately, if not be defeated, then at least uh, tamed um, through the activism that we do. I'm not sure, but what the war right now in Sudan is worse by many measures, although it's, you know, absent from Western media. Um, and of course, the war in Ukraine risks going nuclear more rapidly than any of the others. But I'd like to end them all. Um, one of the biggest impacts of war uh, that's little talked about is the creation of refugees. Um, can you talk about the work you've done in that area yeah. of war damage? Yes, so I practiced as a barrister, which is a type of lawyer in England, and I focused on refugee and detention work. So over the course of about nine years, I was going to court almost every day representing people who had been refused asylum and they had a right of appeal. Um, and I think over that time, I represented people from over 60 different states uh, for uh, political, gender-based violence, religious-based violence, um, various types of violence. Uh, many of them had endured horrific trauma, torture, um, cases of sexual assault, and then been confronted by a Byzantine bureaucracy that, um, you know, pre prevented them from under even understanding what they were going through, not allowed to work, not allowed to be housed, not allowed to marry, uh, not allowed to study. Uh, and I focused actually on detention, so people who were then detained as a consequence of not having status. So um, these were people who were really um, firstly persecuted, but then uh, kind of forgotten. So this gave me a quite a strong overview of, you know, the effect of war um, in all parts of the world. Um, people don't leave countries, their family, unless they have to. Um, either for violence reasons or because there is just simply no life possible where they are and they have to seek some type of security elsewhere. Um, we live in a world that is highly unequal. Um, the distribution of resources are focused in particular parts of the world. There is lack of water, uh, lack of healthcare, lack of education, lack of possibilities in big parts of the world. Um, and unless we address that basic inequality, you know, the refugee issue is going to continue to get worse. It is getting worse. It's getting worse also through climate change, because parts of the world are going to become totally uh, un 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 uninhabitable. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think where we see hundreds of thousands and millions of refugees, I think probably we're working to going towards a world where we have tens of millions of refugees. Um, and it is all connected, though, to this uh, sort of military industrial complex, because um, the majority of the refugees that I was representing were from countries that had been uh, had endured war. So Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, 
Um, many people from Pakistan and Bangladesh, and whilst there hasn't been recently a sort of a high-level high confrontation, these are countries that have been in conflict since they were created. Um, and so, you know, the, we, we, I, the way that I see it, what the solution is to all of this is we have to recognize our interdependence. Um, I think at the, the primary culprit in all of this is this kind of belief that if we primarily look after ourselves only, then we will be fine. But uh, we have to realize how interconnected we all are and that the, the security of someone on the other part of the world might also be my own security. Uh, we are ultimately one species of billions of species. And I think we have to kind of re restore our sense of collective humanity and, and work towards the common good. So yeah, there's so 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 many problems, um, but I think I, I remain an optimist uh, because I believe in the fundamental goodness of human beings. <laughs> well, I couldn't him. agree. I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I'm reluctant to blame most people's habits of thought as much as I want to blame the corruption and profiteering and evil warmongering of a small number of people. That uh, we're speaking with Osman Noor, who is co-director of the Civilian Agenda. Uh, Osman, can you tell us what the civilian agenda is and when it was yeah. created and what it does? Sure. So, I mean, I worked for around four years uh, at, in Geneva around the United Nations as a, as a lobbyist for an international campaign uh, to stop killer robots. So this was autonomous weapon systems, weapon systems that use artificial intelligence to kill people. Um, and through that work, um, I was around the diplomatic community um, where conflicts were spoken about in kind of statistical and detached terms. Um, and perhaps the civilian agenda was to um, bring to life, to tell the stories of civilians um, who were the subject of discussions uh, at the United Nations, uh, to build empathy, to build a sense of connection to the actual subjects of the discussions that were being had in, in the United Nations. You know, the UN, it, it gets a very bad rap and, uh, for, for, for many good reasons, but it's basically a bubble where you have reports on um, places like Sudan, you know, we, we'd have X many people are dead. Um, and then you'd have general overview of the political uh, kind of environment you know, this force and that force and this resource and that resource. Um, but it'd be very detached from the kind of the human story. Um, and we have now opportunities to bring that human story in ways that we perhaps didn't have 20 years ago through multimedia storytelling, through social media, through the kind of technology that we now have, making it far more easy to uh, learn about each other's circumstances. So. The, the original impetus was to um, sort of a cross between journalism and, and documentary filmmaking uh, relating to uh, civilian conflict. So we the intention is to, to uh, engage with uh, civilians and activists and not tell them in a sort of one dimensional way, which is how they tend to be spoken of in the UN, which is victims. But um, here, here the kind of the full um, nature of their their being, but focusing on the conflict so that we can actually learn from that and um, and and then perhaps use that as a tool to affect policy. So uh, we we are making we, there's two documentaries we're currently working on. One is about explosive weapons in populated areas. So the legacy of this is there's a declaration, a political declaration that was joined by, I think, around 90 states um, against the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Um, that was uh, that was completed in 2022. Um, and then we've had the largest amount of explosive weapons used in a populated area in Gaza immediately afterwards. So um, we kind of want to bring that reality to the political discussions as a learning tool so that uh, states can perhaps improve that declaration and maybe make it legally binding. And we've also got one on autonomous weapon systems, which is um, the area I used to work uh, on uh, in my previous job. Uh, but apart from those sort of documentaries where we're using social media, reaching out to uh, people in conflicts and much like you're doing, um, you know, interviewing them and, 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 and sharing 
those insights with the diplomatic community in the UN? It seems, I, I don't watch a lot of corporate television, but it seems to me that big mainstream media outlets in Western countries have sort of done this job with Ukraine. They've told people stories and made you care about those people uh, on one side only, of course, the war in Ukraine, uh, to the extent that you really wish that it wasn't just through social media, but that people were really telling these stories of, of the victims, yeah, the victims of wars uh, on all sides and all wars, because it's it seems to me it's a rare exception that we're getting those stories. Um, you, you, you get those stories about Israelis, but not about Palestinians, and you get them at least uh, in some months gone by in, in large amount about Ukrainians, though not Russians. Um, is, do you see it the same way? Yes, I mean, I actually think one of the primary drivers of uh, human behavior is our own sense of identity. So we tend to concern ourselves much more with those who we consider to be part of our tribe. Um, and we can look at that on a nuclear level. You know, we have our family, you know, primarily we're going to look after our family. They are us. And then we've got our community and then, you know, this imagined uh, community of our nationhood, perhaps. And we uh, we might be very um, upset if someone within our own tribe is um, threatened or hurt. But perhaps if it's someone else, it can feel a little bit more distant. And so how our sense of identity is formed um, will depend on what we're exposed to. Um, and the media has a huge role in that. And so if we are uh, only hearing about certain people and you know their, their lives are made to seem like our lives um, and we build a sense of um, oneness with, with particular types of people, we, we, we will have a sense of protection that we need to have for those people. Um, so unfortunately, you know, this tends to happen on racial lines we could we could see that you know people might protect people of their own race we might protect people of our own nation we might uh protect people of our own sort of um university you know we have a sense of fraternity with people or colleagues or maybe um and so we get that i think from the stories that we hear so we build our own sense of who we are from the stories that we we're hearing around us so if we were to hear, for example, or every day about what was going on in Kashmir, we might have a much stronger sense of, you know, belonging to Kashmir. But, you know, that, that that's not something perhaps most people are confronted with. And so we don't really have a sense of empathy because it's just uh, some, some people far away. So I think, yes, we definitely have that problem in, the, in all media. You know, Western media will protect Western interests. Russian media will protect Russian interests. It's, and it's, so, but now, you know, the interesting thing is uh, I have nephews and nieces. They're all between the ages of five and 12. They're always playing online uh, video games with people all over the world. And my nephew has got a best friend who's in Japan. who they never, he never met him, uh, but he's always playing video games and he's talking on the thing with him. Uh, so I think the generation, uh, who, how, how we perceive ourselves is changing through generations. And I, I, I believe younger generations tend to see themselves as human first and foremost yeah. and then um you know our nation our nationality is perhaps being seen more and more as just a administrative thing as opposed to a kind of cohesive you know this is me i am this uh so i think the stories that we're telling is having an impact on our sense of identity and perhaps perhaps therefore um an impact on how we who we who we consider is, is necessary to protect I really uh, hope you're as, right. As expansive as possible. <laughs> I really, really hope you're right. It's it's maddening that you have to go through each different ethnic group, gender, identity, every demographic, and humanize. You know what are these people before you humanize them? Uh, you know, but it, it, it it's also endless, right? If you have to go through educating people in detail about every little group of people around the globe, you'll never finish. So at some point, you have to jump to your human. We're one global family and, and, and short circuit the whole need 
to humanize every different little group, right? It's, it sounds so obvious. It is obvious, you know, that before you were given your passport, which determined which country, which, which team you were going to support at the Olympics, <laughs> you, were, you, were, you were born human and we, we are all the same. We have like cosmetic differences in how we look and how we talk, but our DNA is the same. Our history is the same. In fact, Homo sapiens um, have only been around on, on the earth for a fraction <laughs> of like how long, let's say, Homo Neanderthal or Homo erectus were here for. So Homo sapiens, a tiny branch of the human species, and we're all that. And, and, and we're all that amongst billions of other species that share this planet. And yet somehow Homo sapiens have divided up the world like no other species has. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're constantly at war with each other. Uh, so I think there is perhaps some type of, call it a spiritual or human humanist uh, awakening that I think we, we must have because not only are we killing each other, we're killing off life on this planet. And I don't say these things exaggerating, you know, I used to, used to be a campaigner for the Green Party in, in the UK. So I used to binge on climate change <laughs> reports. You know, we've got, a, we've got like 70, 80 years according to these reports before the entire ecosystem is totally devastated and potentially unlivable. I mean, right. uh, <laughs> we need to change course drastically. We very, very desperately <laughs> do. And there are people who are trying to get to nuclear war before the climate collapse can do us in. Uh, I... I We've got just five or six minutes left. I'm very interested in this film you're working on on explosive weapons in populated areas because I'm having a hard time imagining any war uh, that didn't in the past hundred years involve explosive weapons in populated areas. This seems like a, a backdoor to war abolition to me. Well, it, you, you, made a, you made a very good point. You can't think of a single war that hasn't had explosive weapons in populated areas in the last 100 years. Because uh, explosive weapons are only sort of 500 years old. Um, and there's, they've only become mainstream as um, weapons that get used in populated areas for probably only 100 years. Um, so this is an extremely new concept. If you think about how wars used to be fought, um, well, t tended to be on, you know, you, you would have horrible, horrific slaughter going on, uh, but m tended to be on the battlefield between soldiers and then soldiers, you know, might go and rape and pillage and plunder. <laughs> but uh, you didn't have this bomb that would get detonated in, an ex in a populated area whereby, um, so the statistic is 90% of those injured and killed when an explosive weapon is used in populated area are civilians. And so, in wars overall, in most wars, it's mostly civilians. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but I think that's pretty well established, right? But 90%. Yeah. 90%. So um, if... if it's so it's such a farcical concept that if if there was someone you wanted to kill that you would think it worthwhile to kill nine others with with that one person to justify killing that one person in ordinary civil society you would think that that, that you'd have to be insane to do that uh that nine other people should die because you want to kill that one person you'd have to be um, insane to want to kill one person as well right <laughs> well indeed indeed um so but this is this is explosive weapons in populated areas so uh there's also all these other the other reverberating effects of explosive weapons in populated. there's the immediate blast that would kill people but then there's all of the um debris and shrapnel that will also kill people. But actually, the, the greatest killer is the effects that it might have on civilian infrastructure that might cause um, disease, that might cause lack of health uh, uh, care availability. Um, so if hospitals are destroyed, you know, it's not just the wounded that will die, but perhaps other people who needed treatment from that hospital that were getting ongoing care from that hospital 
that had all sorts of um, diseases or you know diabetes or things that things that need regular care that are also potentially going to die. So um, and that Gaza Gaza is a very strong example of this because the whole in the whole infrastructure has been destroyed and and there are going to be many many more people who will die other than those who were killed directly through the blast. Right. Um, so you know there was this political declaration. Um, initiated by a group of states um, in Europe uh, that led to, uh, I think, 90 states declaring um, that. So the actual declaration wasn't as strong as it was intended to be, and it ended up be being more of a um, restraining uh, call for restraint as opposed to a call to, for a prohibition. Uh, but it does provide a, a benchmark that can be developed um, and so I think the Gaza example uh, perhaps will strengthen the momentum that is already behind the explosive weapons in populated areas, abbreviated to EWIPA, which is something I recommend all your listeners to go and check out. Um, there are going to be continued conferences on this, and perhaps it could be built up to a, a legally binding rule that says no explosive weapons in populated areas. And yes, you're right, that may be a good way to end war. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that ends war is okay by me. Uh, I look forward to seeing these films. Um, we've just got a minute or two left, Osman Nor. How can people follow your work and see your films when they come out and be in touch with you? This is the civilian agenda. Um, check out our website. We also are building a community of people who uh, may want to do investigative reports or multimedia storytelling relating to particular conflict areas that we welcome and board and train. So if it's a community, we, we have information on the community on the website too, and I, I look forward to working with anyone who's interested in this. Wonderful. The, the organization is The Civilian Agenda. Osman Noor is co-director, and the website is thecivilianagenda.org. We will have the links up at talkworldradio.org. Osman Noor, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. Best of luck and peace. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.